Books. Thank you so much for coming inside on this gorgeous, gorgeous afternoon to be part of this event. So we are a community-owned cooperative bookstore, which means that we are um, owned by, at this point, 686 members of our extended community, which is what allows us to keep the doors open and do things like this and be part of the literary fabric of Tompkins County. Um, which is a great joy to us, and we're particularly lucky that because of Cornell and Ithaca College and the beautiful place that Ithaca is, we have a tremendous resource of local writers to pull upon to have um, wonderful events without anybody having to get here from somewhere else. Um, so if you are ever interested in owning a bookstore without the hassle of running a bookstore, <laughs> We can help you do that, um, and we would love to help you do that. Or if you're interested in any other things having to do with the bookstore, um, our event schedule is always on the website, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, there's lots of things going on through uh, the holiday season here, events and all sorts of other things, so hopefully we will see you again. But right now, Komar is more interesting than I, so I'm going to walk away from the podium, but thank you again so much for coming. <laughs> It really tells us where we are, in, you know, in the, in the state of the world today, right? You have, uh, this is an uprising, uh, narcoeconomics who rules the world, uh, the populist uh, towards a collective liberation, right? You know, so and then I, I thought the poem I'll read first would sort of connect uh, to the themes here, one of the old poems uh, that I wrote around 2002, um, soon, after the, soon after the Iraq war began, and it's called Underneath the Umbrella of War. Tunneling through I-51, I advance from small town to obscure town, population counts based on signs as if numbers of lives lost in a plague or casualties of just living. Wynonna, 27,609, Stockton, 632, Utica, 250, and, and Drover Post, 439. For every town, there are flags in salutation, more flags than I've ever seen of God, race, and country. What shape does the winter's cold wind fluttering across these emblems take? Is it the same wind that whispers through funeral shrouds? And then a fear I cannot name. Here or there, I'm without a face. Hutus, machetes, French and Belgium guns, American bombs that rainbow the skyline of a Baghdad. How many strange fruits shall we bury underneath these emblems? And I think how starvation is hunger turned inward, when the body craves its own flesh until it reveals white bones carelessly covered by old skin. Nighttime is here. The sun has turned its back on this empty landscape of, of bare farm after farm, tied together by last night's snowfall. Peering through my car window, my face half lit, half inside, and half outside keeps getting dismembered by oncoming car headlights. There are rows and rows of snow-covered earth turned inward, dull-lit houses that beckon like a pirate's lighthouse. So I recall an Appalachian school outpost where under the moonshine conf confessions came easy. I no longer dream. I can no longer dream their dreams of mine, the teacher says. My nights are like death. I sleep like I'm dying. In Appalachia, Ohio, I could be home. In this land of scarred hands, of black lungs, of soil turned to the earth's bone, for black diamonds, I could be home. My grandmother died broken by struggles without fruit, bones like hers, flagpoles. What of her raisins in the sun? Every life has a destination, and lying in bed covered only by a moonlight magnified twice by fell snow, me and Sukena delight in contrasts, scars against scars, skin against skin. But outside, the flags keep, keep fluttering. And as I burrow deeper into her skin, this can no longer be a lover's embrace by the tight clutch of history. You know, I might as well add one more only because it's next to, the <laughs> to that poem. It's also about war, uh, glimpses of war. On an, oak, on an oak tree branch, ashen scales for skin and bone, a morning dove comes to nest between dried oases. But these are spineless days, and the tree implodes to the ground. Euthanasia came for it as a grenade in the ripped cage of a small bird that now flies away with nowhere to ever perch. A red petal, pollen has fallen, holds for kin. Uh, uh, let me read something from the new book. I wrote this book 10 years ago, or rather it got published in 2006. So I was thinking, I'd, I, if I keep writing one book of poetry every 10 years, uh, then I, 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 I wouldn't get to, you know, four books because, you know, I'm getting old. So, <laughs> um, so what I find interesting is that Harlan was a consciousness. It's more political. Um, 
you know, logotherapy is more personal in, in a way. I mean, it's still political, but, it, but it's still personal. Um, and the first poem I want to read from this is called, actually, the original title I had was Hunting Words with My Father, right? Uh, so, and it's a poem I wrote for my father's 70th birthday. He's also a writer. You know, and I like to joke around and say that, oh, yeah, for American kids, you know, they either play football or baseball uh, with, their, with their father, you know, that whole thing, father and son. Uh, for me, with my father, and my, my, my siblings as well, who are also writers, uh, we tend to play with words. Hunting words with my father. One morning, I burst into my father's study and said, when I grow up, I too want to hunt. I want to hunt words and giraffes, pictures, buffaloes and books, and he holding a pen and a cup of tea said, little father, to hunt words can be dangerous, but still it is best to start early. He waved his blue big pen and his office turned into Nyandarwa forest. It was morning, the mist rising from the earth like breath as rays from the sun fell hard on the ground like sharp nails. Little father, do you see him? My father asked. No, I said, look again, the mist is a mirror, do you see him? And I looked again, and there was a Maasai warrior tall as a tree, spear in hand. Shadow him, find his movement, shadow him until his movement are your movements. Running my feet along the leaves, I walked to where he was, crouched like him so close to the earth, feet sinking deeper into the earth as if in mud, turning and reading the wind and fading into the mist till I became one with the forest. For half a day we stayed like this. Tired and hungry, I was ready for home. But my father said, I did not say this was easy. You cannot hunt words on a full stomach. And just as soon as he spoke, there was a roar so loud and stomping so harsh that hot underground streams broke open like a dozen or so water pipes, sending hissing streaming water high in the air. I turned to run, but the warrior stood his ground. As the roar and the thunder came closer, his hair braided and full of red ochre turned into dreadlocks, so long they seemed like roots running from the earth. When the transfiguration was complete, before me stood a Mau Mau fighter, spear in one hand, homemade gun in the other, Eyes so red that through the mist they looked like two, like they looked like hot and molten cinders. The long dreadlocks, a thousand thin snakes in the wind, the leaves and the grass and thorns rushing past him. You must help him. Don't just stand there. Help him. My father implored me. But just as soon as I closed my little, hand, my, my little hands into fists, the lion appeared high up in the air, body stretched the whole length, as the Mau Mau pulled the spear like it was a long route from the earth. The lion mid-air tried to recoil. The, the lion media tried to stop, recoiled his talons to offer peace, but it was too late, and he let out another roar as his chest crashed into the spear, breastplate giving way until the spear had edged its way to the heart. Dying, then dead, he continued his terrible arc and landed. I waved, and the picture stood still. My father came up to me and asked, where have you stopped the hunt? I said, but we killed it. We, ha we have what we came for. I pointed to where the Mau Mau warrior was pulling his spear from the carcass. But my father shook his head and said, you have done well, but look closely. How can you carry all that in a word? How can we carry that home? It's too heavy. I laughed and said, Father, you'll help me. But he pointed to the ground, to a steady flow of a bright, thin red river, furiously winding down the grooves, from the grooves of the spear to the earth. I too pointed, unable to speak, the beauty larger than my imagination. I was confused. I had no words. Come, let us go home, little father. When you're of age, you shall find the words, he said. But always be careful. To hunt a word is to hunt a life. Um, uh, let me read a poem for my daughter who is here. Um, oh, yep, there she is. <laughs> you know, if other book is dedicated to her, uh, to her, to, to her and my wife, Maureen. Um, so it's called uh, In Your Name for Nyambura. Bring of rain. I know someday. I will learn to call you by the name your mother and I gave you. But for now, the myriad of little names will do. Rashosho, Kamei, Karei, Nyamtu, all names that amuse us now, as often as they will not you. Kamei, Kashita, or Karei, Kaita, you will abandon, let's face it, even hate me for having them in a poem. But Kamami, little mother, you will not abandon. Yes, it will first tie, your t uh, yes, it will first tie you down, tongue-tie your teachers and friends, but one day your name Nyabura will free you, and that which was once like a prison will be a warm embrace, and that path from which you come will be an anchor and not a chain. Each syllable a reminder, an echo. Um, let's see. 
Uh, let me read one for my wife now that I've read one for Nyabure. <laughs> uh, this was uh, when we first met in, uh, in, in East Lansing uh, in 2001. We are getting old. In a nice way, though. All right, first date. <laughs> uh, first date for Maureen. In courtship, even anecdotes are epic, and we stop to converse and count passing cars, walk again until East Lansing, this pebble of a city is behind us, and past love affairs are spent, and siblings and relatives and friends are all accounted for, and white and black skins left for nearby clansmen, and dreams of doctors and writers are in front of us. We find a stream and a bench and sit down to watch a few renegade ducks leave web trails that shimmer in the moonlight. You and I, we have only spoken ourselves until this, that first kiss that drills well so deep that the stream becomes a river. I hope you didn't find it too cheesy, <laughs> come to think of it. But <laughs> um, now that I should invoke winter, let me read your winter poem called uh, New Frontiers. I lived in Wisconsin, so most of you who know Wisconsin will know it. it's the first time I felt cold, you know, that made me wish I was young, that I could cry, you know, was <laughs> was, uh, was, uh, was uh, Wisconsin winter. Standing by Lake Mendota, it's called New Frontiers. Standing by Lake Mendota, even with a brave sun bouncing off heavy snow rocks, my winter jacket is wrapped tight like a second skin. My naked face, the frontier of the battle between heaven and hell. Soon, my lips will split in a thousand places. The wind chill negative and in, an inhumane number like minus 26. Torture of a thousand pins. Amen. The natives keep saying, this has been a warm winter, much warmer than the last one. They say, in 1902, sometimes I find it's 2001, 1807, or some random year, 10 children, 15 old men, two Africans, and a herd of jersey cows died. This is nothing. I let a cigarette for wood. Spring will be here soon to forget this winter and it's dead. Yes, for each one of us, there are two deaths. Your natural death, the life you die in your flesh, and always to be remembered less than what you really were. Uh, let me read your poem about uh, being an immigrant. I mean, we like to joke how, you know, I don't know if this is for all immigrants, but Kenyans in particular, where somebody will take a photograph next to an expensive car, you know, random expensive car, and send it back home, as a, <laughs> you know, to say, to say all is well. Uh, <laughs> uh, excerpts from an immigrant's diary. Unroll film. Damn it, I have to borrow my neighbor's TV. It's more reasonable to borrow a VCR, an iron or a screwdriver, but not the damp TV. Why not a hammer instead of salt, she asks, when I, point to, when I point at her nice coffee table and porcelain dishes to set. Why don't you take a photograph of my apartment, she offers. Won't be at my apartment now, will it, I say, gently. So I had to prop her TV on two pairs of old cowboy boots stuffed with stones. Photographs, I'm pleased to say, capture a certain degree of affluence and my artistic nuances. Last time they sent me money, I took it to the bar across the street and bought many happy liquids. From a letter fed fedexed in the morning. Do you carry me with you? I walk back to the night we first met when we learned to run in, sack pot in, in a sack holding potatoes on spoons. How we, used, how we used to walk down anonymous stairs as if down the aisle. I put up your photograph every now and then when it's not infinitely easier to find a nearer you. Happy belated birthday. P.S. Without me, can you possibly be happy? From the reply, there is nothing here, not even mad people, except the lady next door who, who walks her little bitch every morning to remind me of you. Uh, I guess there's some latent anger. So let me read you the title, uh, Logotherapy, uh, the poem that's named after, the poem that gives the, the book the name. It, it was from a nightmare I had, actually. You know, I'd, uh, you know, sometimes not nightmares are useful. So I, I just woke up and then just transcribed, you know, what had transpired in the poem. You know, it was about this guy whose child had died and everything he would hold, everything he touched, you know, he would name it after, after, after that child. You know, and this was around um, when the Cuban little boy, Elian Gonzalez, right, uh, when, um, when he was being forcibly taken back to... It would depend on who you talk to, right, you know. Um, but when Janet Reno, who just died, so he's back in the news now, right, because Janet Reno just died, and she's the one who sent the FBI to take him, uh, to, you know, to help him get back to Cuba. Logotherapy. My son was only nine years old when he died two years ago. 
Now I cannot hold anything, not even a pail of water for washing, without remembering his embrace. I call out his name. Elias, Elias, what story shall I, shall I read you tonight? Everything, even my pen and paper, I have named after him. Jealous death came for me last night, an old man, and we walked to the Grand Canyon. There he showed me what should be mine, the peace of naming things by their names, of, of my Elias not dying every time I hold something in my arms. He said, all you have to do is stop renaming the world after your son. God does not like it. For peace I was tempted, but for love I told him he was crazy to think I can forget my Elias. He walked me from my sleep to the morning with a promissory note worth two days. In my hands now, I have two days to name God Elias. Let me read your revenge poem. To the driver who splashed me with rainwater. <laughs> Whether a pedestrian on the sidewalk, commuter in the train, or driver in a car, we all keep pace with our own death. So thanks for the cold blessing, but all the same, may you find you sooner. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to read two more poems. One is called Kenya. Um, this was, I wrote this poem in 2007 when uh, violence had broken out in Kenya, right? You know, post electoral violence. And I'm reading it now, I guess, as a warning. Kenya, a love letter. Inside looking out, snow is falling, and I'm thinking how happy we once were when promises and dreams came easy, and how when we, lovers covered only by a warm Eldor at night, you waved the prophecy at a shooting star and said, when the time comes, we shall name our first child Kenya. And how I laughed and said, yes, our child then shall be country and human. And we held hands, rough and toughened by shelling custard seeds. My dear, when did our clasped hands become heavy chains and anchors holding as to the mines and diamonds and oil fields? Our hands callous by love and play, these same hands, when did they learn to grip a machete or a gun to spit hate? And this earth that drinks our blood like a hungry child, this earth that we have scorched to cinders, when we're done with it, how much of it will be left for Kenya? My dear, our child is born, is dying. Tomorrow the child will be dead. Um, so let, let me end with a, with a, since I started with an old poem, let me end with, a, with an old poem as well. Um, you know, I call it a collage of death masks. Right, you know, I used to re read a lot of biographies. So what I did was, you know, for the revolutionaries, you know, it's, it's a poem dedicated to revolutionaries or revolutionary poets, activists, and so on and so forth. So, so I'll take their last words as, 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 as in their biographies and then have that as the, uh, as the poem. So it's called um, A Collage of Death Masks. Steve Biko. With our hands, with our two hands, we ply open my chest for arrows. Tips poisoned with a black ink, I write what I like. Amilka Cabral. To peer past midnight, I have returned to the source. Che Guevara. Next door, a single gunshot announces my friend's death. Hours later, I keep turns and I stand on my wounded leg. Shoot, coward. Your guillotine can only kill flesh, not what it dreams. Franz Fanon. We are nothing unless less to a cause. In my militant servitude, I find freedom. Ruth first. When I fell, it was only to go find Montlani to tell him Mozambique was free and in Azania freedom had begun to thaw. Gashi Aloka. In the distance between the bullet and my heart, I cannot remember the prayer my mother taught me. Tell her that her love negotiated this passage for me. Rosa Luxemburg. They keep drawing blood from the toiling oxen. Don't they know that death and democracy are infinite, that we each get ours in the end? Montlani. I read Marx in struggle only to realize I was reading him a second time. Karimi Dudu. Possibility of life actualizes in the fact of freedom. I do not fear them or their death. Arthur Nodje. This suicide, final plunge, this my last poem, will it erase appetite. Malcolm X. I do not see bullets or death hurtling toward me. I see truth, and if it, and if it fails to heal, then it can only kill. Cancer or Weaver. My blood soaking into the earth to heal its wounded limbs, my libation, Wayaki. In my future, I see Kemadi, always on his feet, arm in arms. And for my last poem, it's called um, Perfect Silence is when each thing sings itself. Standing outside with the rain gone, droplets roll down rooftop gutters, straining drop, straining drop by drop, till a rough wind making its way home through the acacia trees 
turns trickles of water to surprise waterfalls. Perfect silence is never silent. Perfect silence is when each thing sings itself. Thank you.